The Mysterious Indian Image Stone by Dennis M. Morrison. Introduction, Fall, 1991. The events I'm about to relate to you occurred in August of 1986. There is no doubt in my mind <clears throat> that this mystery will never be solved. A principal player in this story is Jerry Wagner, who recently passed away. Jerry was a historian um, and had an avid uh, affection for the Native American people. And we discussed the events only a few days before his death. He was just as mystified by them then as he was when they actually took place. As for me, these events are the strangest I have ever been caught up in. And yes, they are 100% true. And just as Jerry was, I am still mystified by them. For a long time, I questioned why the events I am about to describe to you happened to me. In fact, I still question that when I reflect on all of it. If a message from the past was trying to be relayed to the present, someone more in tune with that sort of thing could have easily been found. I am a Christian with a background of attending Southern Baptist churches. A message from the past, perhaps from someone departed, well, that is against the grain of my faith. However, some extraordinary circumstances had me in their grasp in November and December of 1986. The story actually finds its beginnings earlier, um, in August, as I already said, of 1986. This particular day was very hot and humid. Uh, our dog Samson, in an effort to keep cool, had dug a hole by his house. My wife Kathy and I, now divorced, but <clears throat> were avocational ar um, archaeologists, and we always were watching for relics wherever we, wherever we walked. While taking Samson a pan of cold water, Kathy discovered in the dirt that he had kicked up three pre prehistoric pottery shards. <clears throat> Kathy was quite excited about this for several reasons. First, after hunting for and finding relics of ancient man all across northeast Michigan, we had never considered looking in our own backyard. Second, the find was made directly next to a small building in which we had established a museum to display our treasured finds. The odds of finding such materials next to this building by the dog who had been put there to protect our finds must have been very high indeed. <clears throat> we got our equipment together and began digging. We were making such a great amount of finds that I called into work um, that particular day, told them I was sick because I was not about to give up on, on the digging. By the time we had completed our initial work late that afternoon, we had ex excavated a four by five foot area. We had unearthed some 1,500 pot shards representing two individual pots. Uh, they were, the way they were arranged in the ground, it looked as though the pots had been lift, left standing there so many long years ago and finally fell in upon themselves. I packed these pieces away with the intent of trying to reassemble them during the cold winter months. There was quite a lot of other material excavated. The ground yielded to us a fine Hopewell-style arrowhead um, and on finished ground green stone, a portion of a human arm bone, a human head and profile fetish, hundreds of pieces of flint, and the subject of this report, a stone that resembled a celt, which is to say, an ungrooved stone axe. <clears throat> the stone did not really have the appearance of having been worked by ancient man. It had a peculiar shape quite by the course of nature. Though by its positioning among the other relics, there can be no doubt that it serves some purpose for the prehistoric people at this site. The stone held my fascination for some reason, and I set it down on a nearby table outside to examine it more closely when our work was finished. I am ashamed to admit, though, that I forgot all about the stone for a while, well, almost three months to be exact. Early in November, as the weather was becoming inclement, I dug out, no pun intended, the pottery shards and worked day and night trying to fit as many together as I could. Of the 1,500 pieces, I was only able to assemble 17 of the larger ones. These formed a section of pot about 12 by 7 inches in size. Now, I was very pleased by that <clears throat> because uh, it was larger than anything I had ever been able to assemble before. I decided to take the work over to Jerry Wagner, friend and local historian, so I could get his opinion. As I was packing the pottery, I suddenly remembered the salt-like stone that I had left on the table in the backyard. I retrieved it and examined it carefully. I packed the stone with the pottery, as I wanted to get Jerry's input on this piece also. When I arrived at Jerry's home on the evening of November 25th, he was very anxious to see the pottery. Jerry informed me that he had never seen such a large reconstruction from our area. 
I had wanted to show him the salt like stone first, sort of save the best for last, but he took the pottery from the bag that I had it packed in. As Jerry's wife Marilyn watched on, he set up the pottery on the living room floor and propped it up with the salt like stone. He began making all sorts of measurements and for the next 45 minutes we had a very in-depth discussion about the pot and the people who had made it perhaps as many as 2,000 years before. In point of fact, I was so engrossed by the conversation that it seemed almost like I was back with those ancient people. After we had exhausted our conversation, Jerry picked up the pottery and gently handed it to me. I placed it back in the bag as he lifted the celt and said to me, Dennis, what are the marks on here? I thought at first he was joking, as there had not been any trace of anything on the stone when I examined it before packing it. Now, however, there was a string of letter-like symbols across the face of the stone. What was really uncanny is that they felt slightly raised from the stone. All three of us were shocked, to say the least. That night, we could come up with no logical explanation for the symbols. It seemed as though, perhaps, contact between the stone and the pottery might have caused the symbols to appear. Perhaps our, the depth of our discussion had somehow contributed. I took the stone home that night, <clears throat> and my first thought was to try to photograph the symbols. And I tried, and I was not a bad photographer. The camera lens kept fogging up, and the pictures came back overexposed. But all was not lost, as the symbols could still be seen. The letters began to fade after I did the photographs. By the following morning, they were completely gone. But there was much more to happen yet. When the photos came back overexposed, I took them to Matt Davis to have them computer enhanced, which was a fairly new technology at that time. There on the photograph were symbols we had missed before because they were so much smaller and lighter than the letters. These were stick figures. There was one that resembled a man holding a bow. Still another looked like a man um, running down a path. These smaller symbols were similar in appearance to the rock art formed are found in southern portions of lower Michigan. The most active date for the stone was November 28, 1986. Jerry and I had been invited to a special after Thanksgiving dinner at the home of a friend in Cummins, Michigan. Neither of us or, or neither of our wives could attend. Being a good 45 minute drive away, we took the stone with us and examined it very closely. There was not the slightest sign of any symbol across the face of the stone. With myself and Jerry, the stone had become a favorite topic of conversation. Now, there were eight people at dinner that night, and I guided the conversation so that we could bring up the stone. Jerry described to the eagerly listening audience what had happened on the 25th. After listening to our description, all were in agreement that they wanted to see the stone. I excused myself from the table and went to the car to get it. When I reached the car, I could tell right away that the stone was beginning to do something. On the face, a dark circle was forming. This dark area looked sticky, but not, not, did not feel so to the touch. It resembled a substance that was wet and looked as though it were actually being secreted from the stone. But I said, as I said, I could feel nothing there. This time, the form that was appearing was not raised, as it had been the first time. When I looked at it and showed everyone, they were all amazed and excited. A man who I had not seen before nor since held the stone, and over the next hour, much happened. Many symbols appeared on the face of the stone in rapid succession. Indeed, it was so fast that we were unable to copy them all down. A symbol looking like an open-topped four appeared with the numbers two and seven, and the open four changed to an old-fashioned pointed-topped four. The action of the changes reminded me of how the numbers change on the face of a digital watch. The original dark circle changed from just a circle to a circle with lines extending out of it. This gave the stone an eerie resemblance to a face in profile, the circle being the eye with lashes. I wondered if this might not represent seeing something, something from the past. Two other small circles appeared, one with a sort of tail. These were on either side of the larger circle. By the way, at some point during all of this, Mike, the man who had been holding the stone, handed the stone over to someone else and left hurriedly. He was rather unnerved by what was going on. The circle was still there when Jerry and I left for home about 7 o'clock p.m. On the way home, we pulled off the road and turned on the car light. We examined the stone to see if any further changes had taken place. We observed that the eye-like circle was still there, 
In the excitement, I had completely forgotten that my camera was in the car. Here on the side of M72, I snapped several pictures, and then we returned to our respective homes. One more um, occurrence took place that evening, and this time it was uh, seen by my wife and my mother. The circle was still present with the alleged eyebrows. Over this formed a symbol that looked like a stylized number 8. This also faded fast, and the photo produced no image. The stone seemed to have spent most of its energy and was running out of steam. Nothing more appeared on the stone until the 30th of November. Symbols that resembled the numbers 7, 1, and 5 appeared, and a short time later, a diamond shape with a sort of tail. On December 5th, towards one end of the stone, there appeared light veins of gold and one of silver. These lasted for several days. Other vague shadowy figures appeared on the stone through the 1st of January, 1987. Few were well enough defined to make out that they were fast and coming and just as quick and fleeting. In the summer of 1987, my brother-in-law, Marlon Marks Jr., and I doused the area where the relics had been found. We used two coat hangers bent in L shapes. To dowsing, I will state emphatically that I was a skeptic until this day. As we walked across my backyard, the rods would cross at the exact perimeter of where our digging began remain crossed for the entire area that we that had been dug and then uncross at the other side. A dozen or so tries produced the same results even with me doing the dowsing. There was nothing left in the way of relics, so this reaction of the rods seemed unusual to me. There of course is the possibility that there could be a deep burial there. Because we had the property up for sale and were in the process of moving to Greenbush, excavations to find out if anything else was there were unfortunately never carried out. I have always since felt that further excavations might have held the key to the symbols, as using the dousing rods we found several other areas in the backyard which produced the same effect. The area we were able to excavate was really quite small. In looking at the relics from this site, there were several unique things. First of all, is why there was only one human arm, arm bone at the site. If it had, um, if it had been a burial site, there should have been more than just one. This in itself I feel might be of great importance in solving the mystery of the stone. I have found no one yet that can shed any light on this. We have looked at a great many relics found in the Ascota area. In fact, we have looked at the remains of well over 500 prehistoric pots that we ourselves excavated. The pottery here was unusual and different. The decorative motif was quite different. The dec decoration was executed in a much more precise fashion. A crosshatch design was lightly etched into the, into the pot. This is totally unique from our area. Although I have made no concrete measurements, the one pot would have been an unusually large based on the number of shards we found and the reconstruction of the piece that I made. Also highly suspect is a slightly modified stone that is without question a human head and profile fetish. There are stones um, naturally set into the fetish where the mouth, nose, and ear would be. The ear stone is notched. There was no stone in place uh, by nature where the eye should be, but one can still faintly see the remains of an eye symbol where it had been drawn onto this particular stone. What is more is that the eye does not at all resemble Indian work, but it's um, style quite Egyptian in appearance. This human head fetish was found on a pile of flint flakes which resembled a primitive altar. Um, the back of the fetish was somewhat hollowed out for an unknown reason. I suppose it was not a real surprise that I could find no support or belief from the professional community in Michigan. In fact, what I found was ridicule. I was really happy that the events had been witnessed by so many people who, uh, who could bear me out on this. My quest for understanding led me to write a letter to the Early Sites Research Center in Rowley, Mass, uh, Massachusetts. Their archaeological director, James P. Whithall, read my letter. At long last, I found someone to take me seriously. Before replying to me, he wrote to Terry Ross, past president of the American Dowser Society, and I was checked out by him through methods I don't understand. Kathy and I were found to be truthful by Mr. Ross, and then Mr. Whithall replied. I would like to quote a portion of his response. He said, Certainly, the, letter is, uh, the lettering is familiar, and the symbols represent sun and moon. 
It is possible that this was someone's talisman. But with the unusual nature of the appearance of the markings, I would suggest it is from a shaman's kit. Strange artifacts of this nature do show up all over the world, though most are inclined to shake their heads and cast them out. I am inclined to think that, their reali that the reality is yet to be understood. It was certainly recovered in the right context, end quote. There have been many times that I have walked out into my little museum and all the relics would be dry, yet this stone would be dripping wet. It seems to attract people to it in a curious way as it did with me in the beginning. The stone is quite unassuming in looks. Certainly, there are far more beautiful pieces in my collection. Yet invariably, people come in and pick up this particular stone, only the, to then be amazed to hear the story behind it. Some people claim that when they pick it up, um, their fingers have a tingling sen sensation, and I myself have experienced this. Now, I know I may offend some of the readers with this view, but remember, it is just speculation. Because of my background, I do not believe in communication with the dead. Thus, I have had to try to deduce some more logical explanation for what happened than a psychic one. Could it possibly be, as Mr. Whitehill suggested, that this was a shaman or a holy man stone? Could it be that someone endowed with strong powers could have charged this with some sort of message to be delivered up to its finder? If such is the case, how terribly sad that it should fall into my hands rather than a person who might have understood the communication. While Jerry was in the hospital for heart surgery, a book was given to him called Lame Deer, Seeker of Visions, um, written by John Lame Deer. His book tells how some stones were sacred to the Indians. Jerry fell in part. Perhaps an answer was found in this book, and I tend to agree. I would like to quote a brief passage from his book where he spoke of, of messages and stone. And I quote, And these stones bear a hidden message which they sometimes reveal to us, invisible writing for those who read with their hearts. The old medicine man used to talk to the stones and w was able to communicate with them. White people have forgotten this and have lost the power that is in the rocks. Unquote. Perhaps the white race has forgotten this, or, or maybe we never even knew, save for a few who have been trained in the ways of American in, Native American Indian lifestyle. I wonder if it might not have been some deep down racial memory from Maryland, or myself, that acted as, as a catalyst to set the stone in action, because we both had some Native American blood in us. As I stated from the outset, I don't understand what it is that happened. It is truly an unsolved mystery. I do know now, as I look back on those events with a kind of fondness, and every now and then pick up the stone, it kindles my imagination, though it no longer even makes my fingers tingle. If there was a power there, it is now exa has exhausted itself. My first inclination on riding home from Jerry Wagner's house that night in November was fear. I was alone, and it was dark, and the unknown was sitting next to me in a bag on the car seat. I wanted to stop the car and throw the stone into the woods as far as I could, but boy, am I glad I didn't. Instead, I turned on the dome light, and in the car, I bravely drove home. After that, I had no fear of the stone, only fascination. I knew that it meant no harm. Had I tossed it out that night, I would have missed out on one of the most unusual experiences of my entire life. Um, retrospect in 1991, believe it or not, that is what happened. I have all my original journal entries, drawings, and photographs. Time has not lessened the mystery for me, and it didn't lessen the mystery for Jerry either. Now that he is on the other side, perhaps he understands it all quite clearly.